Well, good morning, everyone. Well, let's stand up and let's do a Christmas song. How about it?
Good morning, everyone. Um, that was actually really late. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How are you guys? I'm so glad. I'm Lindsay Payton. For you all who do not know me, and this is the second Sunday of Advent, and so today we are going to light the second candle. If I can, hold on. I actually, yeah, I think yeah. I. Can. If I don't do anything else today, I work the lighter correctly. Okay. Um, so on Christmas Eve, we're going to light the center candle. And then Sunday, December 17th, which is next Sunday, at 5 p.m., we are going to have our new Harvest Family Christmas party. We're going to have coffee, cocoa, and desserts. And then we're going to go give, give the gift of song by caroling. And if anyone has... Any suggestions of places that they would like us to go caroling and don't mind to hear us sing, then you can write their names down. <laughs> all right, guys. So that's pretty much all we got going on. But earlier this week, I I go to Frankfurt High, and so I had the real care baby because I'm in an early lifespan class. It's a baby doll that cries, okay? And my mom definitely told me that I looked special, like I was a 15-year-old with a baby doll carrying it around and feeding it a bottle. But anyways, when I got it, the lady said, don't let this stress you out. And I was like, that should have been a sign at the beginning. I was like, oh, okay. And then when I get to the first class in the first 30 minutes, this baby cried four times. And I was like, what is wrong with this baby? Like, I don't know what type of baby this is, but it is not a normal one. And um, then I was, I was like, I'm going to be so stressed by the end of the day. And then I got to the end of the day and someone asked me, you must be really stressed. And I was like, actually, I'm not. I'm pretty chill. Like, I was like, I couldn't really explain it. And then this reminded me of how God gives us peace and how sometimes it's unexplainable. And it reminded me of this verse in 2 Thessalonians 3.16. It says, now may the Lord of peace himself give you his peace at all times in every situation. The Lord will be with you all. See, there's going to be many situations in our lives that we feel like we can't take it or it's too much. And all we have to do is come to God and he will give you peace. But this peace is not something that the world can give. God's peace lasts, okay? And we can have peace in knowing that he's here in every situation. And sometimes people try to go through their lives without God and without his peace. But when you do this, when you put your trust in things of the world, then when the world crumbles, you're going to go with it. But when you put your trust in God and you give him your life, you can have peace in knowing that you aren't going to fall when the world... <laughs> with the world because your portion isn't in it and so only god can give you the peace you need and as we go into prayer i want you to ask yourself am i giving my troubles to god and allowing him to give me peace or am i trying to deal with my problems on my own and falling with the world thank you lindsay amen i wonder if paul when he wrote that scripture uh in philippians foresaw that you would be carrying around a crying baby doll you know, that he would give you peace. The Lord would give you peace. I don't think so. But anyway, welcome to New Harvest, everybody. Everybody excited about the Advent and Christmas season. Amen. Amen. Looking forward to it. Uh, next Sunday, again, uh, is our Christmas party. I just want to reiterate something that uh, we do have Acts of Harvest next Sunday. I, I failed to send that to, to Lindsay to let you know. But Acts of Harvest will be between 3 and 4 p.m. and uh, we'll have a meal and uh, groceries for people. And then at 5 p.m. we'll start our Christmas party. And uh, we added to this uh, um, just this past week. We would like everybody who would like to engage in this to a white elephant Christmas exchange. And so the point of this is not really that we give each other great gifts, but really it's more of uh, the funniest gift in some ways. Um, so we would like you to bring something. Whatever the value of the range of it, it doesn't really matter. But it has to be already in your possession. So basically, you can clean out your house and just bring some stuff. Just wrap it up, put it in a box, wrap it up, and then we're going to exchange it to each other. And it's going to be lots of fun. You can steal the presents. You can 
throw them in the garbage right afterwards if you need to. It doesn't really matter. It's just going to be a fun time. We'll have desserts. We'll have coffee if you have the ability to make a dessert or bring a dessert to share or buy a dessert. It doesn't matter. We're going to have coffee and desserts, and we're going to have a good time together just as church family uh, fellowshipping with one another. And so don't forget, find some junk, wrap it up, and bring it to next Sunday night at 5 o'clock, and we'll have a good time uh, at our Christmas party. And then we'll go caroling, which will be great. So uh, with that, um, what's next? I forgot. Prayer. Prayer. Thank you. Sorry. Behind um, you. Don't know what happened, but something. that's what I need to do. Thank you so much. Inclement weather. We're getting to that time of year where there's weather, our conditions. So please just text hi to that message. And so if there is a delay in service or cancellation of service or something like that, then you will receive a text message the morning of uh, the service so that you won't be uh, here or go out in conditions that are not safe. So please just text that number, text hi to that number, and we will make sure uh, that you are on the text message subscription list uh, for New Harvest. Appreciate that. Um, with that, Oh, uh, no, we don't have one, but we, we, we are going to need some help at the beginning of the year uh, with uh, media teams, so running sound, and the computer. So if that's something that interests you, uh, even if it doesn't interest you, but you just want to serve God, okay? You just want to serve the Lord and serve the church, then uh, we will teach you and train you. Ryan will teach you and train you. How about that? Or somebody will. So uh, if that's something that interests you, uh, please see Ryan or Kim Lee uh, in the near future. We greatly appreciate it. Um, with that, let's go to prayer. Uh, we do need to pray for the cables. Uh, Robert and Phyllis are sick, and Robert's recovering from RSV. Um, and so please keep them in your prayers. Uh, any other prayer requests that we need to bring before the Lord this morning? Okay. Yeah, tell me his name again. Needs a job, okay. Yeah. Yes. My father needs to have a heart issues now, and he has to get tested. <coughs> okay. Tell me his name. David. David. <coughs> yes, Ellie. Pray for my son. <coughs> Over the past few months, we've requested prayer for a little girl named Kristen when she passed away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Kim Lee. Kim Lee. Yeah. Yeah. Kim hurt her back this week again, and it's just the arthritis and things are kind of getting her down. Not just physically, but also mentally getting her down a little bit. So keep both her and Chris in prayer. Yes, Debbie. Absolutely. Pray for Jasper, yes. Uh huh. Yes, absolutely. Tell me your names again. Ernie and Shirley. Ernie and Shirley. Thank you. Keep praying for Ricky. Pray for my brother. Ricky has a chemo. Your uncle Ricky. Radiation. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Pastor. Israel. Israel. Yes. Yes. Next door neighbor, they turned her dad over to hospice, and her name was Ann Hines. Ann. Sure, absolutely. Yes. All right. Actually, yeah. Allie's having a place cut up for Lenny on Wednesday. Say it again. <coughs> Allie has what? A place cut <laughs> up. She's going to have a place Oh, okay. A, a dermatological issue, okay? <laughs> yes. We'll pray. My leg's getting cut off. Hey, legs, that's what I heard. I don't know. <laughs> Allie's having your leg amputated this week. <laughs> yes, we're absolutely, we'll pray. Some of those that, that you heard that are especially physical prayer requests, please just walk over and lay hands on them when we pray for them during this time. And let's begin with the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
and give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts as we forgive those who have debted against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord, we thank you that we can pray and we can submit these requests to you this morning, Lord. Father, we pray for Johnny's son that he would have a job soon, Lord Jesus, that you would open up opportunity for him, and Lord, it would be the right place at the right time, and Lord, we pray that you would give great provision, Lord, in the midst of this family, I pray. Lord, we pray for David, uh, who's uh, having physical issues, Lord Jesus, and uh, Father, I pray that your hand would be extended and bring healing to him, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we pray for Allie and an upcoming surgery. Father, that you'd be with her. Guide the doctor's hands. Give them wisdoms and every, everything, Lord Jesus, that they would have wisdom of what to do or not do. And Lord, let your grace be amply supplied and that there be a quick and easy recovery uh, from that uh, surgery, Lord, we pray. Father, we pray for the country of Israel, Lord Jesus, and the whole land. Father, that peace would be applied. And that, Father, that you would bring resolution and peace to this long, uh, drawn-out conflict, Lord God, both not uh, not just in Israel, but also in Ukraine, Lord Jesus. We pray for the peace of Israel and for Ukraine, Father, we pray. Lord, we pray for um, uh, Carnes, Lord Jesus, the neighbor, uh, Lord, this dear elderly lady that's getting uh, to hospice, Father God, that you would open up an opportunity for Teresa, Lord Jesus, to speak into her life. And Lord, that you would be gracious in the midst of uh, this end of life moment, Lord Jesus. And uh, that, Father, that she would be a precious saint, become a precious saint, Lord Jesus, and give Teresa that great witness to her. And Father, we pray for Jasper Curtis, Lord God, that you would bring healing to his body. Father, the weakness that he's dealing with is also the falls, that you would protect him and be near to him, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. And Father, we pray for uh, Shirley and uh, her husband, Father God. We ask that you would just be with them in the midst of blood pressure and, and heart failure, Father God. That Lord, that you would extend your hand to them and that you would bring grace, Lord, to, to Ernie and Shirley, Father God. And that you would be deeply, uh, Lord Jesus, uh, uh, healing to their bodies, I pray, and comforting to them, Lord, in the midst of all of this. Lord, we pray for Ali's son, Lord, as he grieves loss, Lord Jesus. And Father, we just pray that your hand would be stretched out to him, Lord, that you would be an incredible witness of comfort and peace and joy during this season that we celebrate the peace of God coming into the world. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would touch uh, Ricky, Father God, as he deals with his chemo and radiation for lung cancer, Father, pray that your hand would be extended to him to bring healing and restoration and peace and renewal, Father. We pray for Kim Lee this morning, Lord Jesus, that, Father, that you would touch her in every way, mind, body, soul, Lord God, and bring healing to this arthritis and healing, Lord Jesus, and relief to her back, and that you would renew her in the power of the name of Jesus, Lord. And Father, we just pray that you continue to provide uh, for every need of our congregation and be graciously present, Lord, in these days, and that you would renew us, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And the church said together, Amen. 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 Would you stand? Let's worship the Lord this morning.
Lord, we just thank you for your arrival. Lord, we thank you for the anticipation of the fact that, Lord, we not only celebrate, Lord Jesus, your first arrival, but, Lord, we are celebrating your second arrival, Lord Jesus. And we pray, as in the book of Revelation says, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus, come. That, Father, that you would come soon. Jesus, that you would return for your people soon, we pray. Come, Emmanuel, come, we pray. In Jesus' name. The church said together, Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. Uh, today, the kids are in church with us and in worship with us, and I have two quiet seat prizes this morning. It's Christmas time, so we be overly generous. So, um, so guys, if you're paying attention, you're listening. They're right now. They're coloring a, a Christmas time. Uh, picture right now, so uh, that is all part of it. However, we won't have a coloring contest today, uh, but you can still stick them on the family worship coloring wall out there. Um, what this, I, I do want to say that for the last three weeks, I've been working on this sermon in particular, and basically I want it to be the centerpiece of the Advent season, that this season really uh, is this parable, if you will, encapsulates, I think, to a large degree, what this, uh, this parable's meaning is for the Advent season. Um, with that, um, I'd like to say that when I was a teenager, my mom used to make fun of me all the time. You know, it's one of those things. It just makes you stronger. And uh, one of the things she used to make fun of me was is for not wringing out my uh, washcloth in the shower. And she said, you know, you're just big, strong football player working out every day, and you can't even wring out your towel. What I'm, Mom, I'm going to wring it out today. I'm going to wring this sermon out, okay? I'm going to wring this parable out. That's what I just want to say that, just to, just to clarify. Um, I want to challenge you to be oriented, really, between three different events. First, of course, Jesus' arrival, his first arrival. The second would be Easter, of course, his resurrection, his death and resurrection. But then third event that we should be oriented to is his return. Yeah. So his arrival in the first right, his second, uh, his resurrection, and third would be his ultimate return at the end of time. And that's really what this parable is a lot about. 
Um, so last week I've been reading Flannery O'Connor's uh, short stories. I encourage you that if you like literature at all, that you would pick up her uh, book. Becca told me the other day uh, that I had a crush on Flannery O'Connor, which is a really nerdy thing to say um, about somebody, by the way, for a literary author who wrote 100 years ago. But I understand it. It is – I do have a, quite a nerdy side to me in some ways. Um, uh, the story is called The Turkey. And it's one of her short stories, and it's about an 11-year-old boy who is out playing in the woods, and while he's out in the woods, he sees a wounded turkey. The turkey had been shot. He didn't know it at the time, but he thought in his mind he had conflated this to the point, kind of switching back between like a Western motif of going down in the valley to cut off the turkey or something like that, and then going back and forth to just the fact that if he caught this turkey with his bare hands, that when he took him home, his brother would be deeply impressed, his dad would be impressed, his mom would be impressed. He thought that this could be the best thing in the world for this 11-year-old boy. And so he chases the turkey through the woods for a, an hour. And at the end of the moment, when he's getting ready to lay hands on the turkey, suddenly he runs into a tree as he is chasing him and is laid flat on his back and out of breath. And so he lays there, and at that point in time, you know, uh, leading up to the anticipation of, he was thanking God for the opportunity, you know. But when he's laying on his back with the wind knocked out of him, immediately he begins to curse. Okay, Flannery or O'Connor may be, may be teaching us a little bit about human nature, right, and how fickle it is and how we can go back and forth. There's a lot of deep interpretations you can find in her text. So he gets up, dismayed, his head down, and he begins walking back towards town. However, guess what he runs into? He had literally run the turkey to death, and there it was laying on the ground, the prized turkey that he'd been after. And so as proud as he possibly could be, he flings the turkey around his shoulder and he walks through the longest way that he could possibly find through town. And of course, as you can imagine, friends and neighbors, this is like setting in the, in the south in the 1940s. So you can imagine what this would have been like. Everybody was gawking at this turkey that this young boy, he says, had literally run down. He had run and caught it with his bare hands. Didn't even shoot the turkey. He was just got the turkey. And so as he walks through town, uh, several people walk, uh, walking by and gawking at the turkey, making comments about him and how good of a hunter he must be. Yeah. And as he heads towards the edge of town, towards his house, uh, a few country boys is what they called them, as Flannery O'Connor called them. A few country boys followed him out. And he was thinking in his head that, of course, that he was going to show off his turkey. And so uh, he turns around, the country boys are right behind him, and the, the boy says, where'd you find that turkey? And he spits a little bit of tobacco out on the ground. And, you know, they're country boys, I guess, whatever. And so as this situation goes down, he holds up the turkey to him, and the boy says, let me see that. And he grabs the turkey. And to ruler's dismay, the country boy flung it across his shoulder and walked off with it. Jaw dropped, as you can imagine, Upset, deeply emotional at this moment, the story ends abruptly as Ruler turns around and just runs home. His turkey was no longer his. Oh. There's lots of interpretations I like to say. Again, the, the fickle nature of, of humanity. I actually read a, um, a theological paper on the interpretation of this particular uh, uh, story by Flannery O'Connor. Um, one possible fact is, is that we, in good times and with hopeful anticipation, we tend to praise God. But when things go badly, we tend to curse. Yeah. And then we go back and forth. I think that's a good interpretation of this particular story. Um, another interpretation could be as simple as this, which is my interpretation, is that when I was sitting in a tree stand with my 11-year-old son, William, the other day, he just fell asleep, you know. Uh, and I had been pondering this interpretation. Maybe it's just a great story about what it would be like to be an 11-year-old boy chasing down a turkey in the woods and catching it by hand. I mean, maybe it's just as plain as the interpretation could possibly be and how much fun that would have been. 
And my interpretation or application is this, that I really think that that's what the Advent season is about. The Advent season is about chasing Jesus down. Is about getting as close to him as we possibly can. And the adventure that Christian life can be, if we look at it like it really is, that we can be and follow Jesus as closely as we possibly can. And the communicative joy with the deep pursuit of the Lord and to stay as close as him as we humanly are able to. And this is, again, as I said last week, what the Advent season is all about. Our vision of the soon coming king coming back to earth. Contra the commercialized versions of what Christmas time and Advent is all about. Uh, I love what Shane Claiborne said. I'll say it again as I said it last week on Thanksgiving. We give thanks for all that we have. And then the next day we uh, abuse each other trying to get more of what we do not have. Um, That's Black Friday in a nutshell. (laughs) This is a good reminder to say that you're not one purchase away from happiness. You are not one purchase away from happiness. Advent is about living in a profoundly broken world and wounded world, which is oriented to the light of the world coming back to earth again. Advent is about looking for the signs of hope of the return of the king. And establishing that reign on earth. Advent is about anticipating God's return. And his ultimate just and perfect reign in the world. If you are by any degree anxious or frustrated or upset at the rulers of the world. And how they are constantly violently attacking each other. Then you are anticipating the reign and the rule of Jesus Christ when he sets foot on earth again. Yes, sir. That's what this Advent season is about. And so I want to preach today, and I'm going to ring it out as best as I can uh, this season, the parable of the ten virgins or the ten maidens. And it comes from Matthew chapter 25, if you would turn in your Bibles, Matthew 25 and verse 1 through 11. But this parable is not what it seems at first. It speaks of readiness for the rule and reign of Jesus at a new level. And there are some things that we need to prepare ourselves for in the new heavens and the new earth. And just one of the ones that I like to throw out there uh, for you is is that um, those people that you don't really like that worship with you on Sunday mornings, you better get used to them because you'll be dwelling in eternity with them. Uh, Those folks that... um, Uh, may not have the same exact theological beliefs as you. You may have a Baptist next door to your mansion in the heavenly realm, okay? You may have a Catholic. Just get used to them now is what I'm trying to say because there will be people that you may not have liked that will be in eternity with you. So learn to love each other here on earth because ultimately you're going to dwell with them for eternity. So I think that's a good point to remember. Jesus' throne will be down the street from us, dwelling in the celestial city. The key here is readiness. Prepare your heart today for room for the king of the world. And so Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 through 13 says this. It says, At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins or maidens, Jesus says, who took their lamp and went out to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were foolish and five were wise. And the foolish ones took their lamps, but they did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took their oil in jars along with their lamps. And the bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. And then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for the both of us. Instead, go to those who sell the oil and buy for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived, and the virgins who were ready went in with them to the wedding banquet. And the door was shut. And Later others also came, saying, Lord, Lord, they said, open up the door for us. Verse 12, but he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you, therefore keep watch. Because you do not know the day nor the hour. Father, I pray that you would drive this word deep into our hearts. Lord, explode your word before our eyes so we can see, we can understand, and we can know how to live this Christian life 
Lord, let our hearts be prepared for your return, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm sure that this story is apocryphal. It is not a real story, but I think it worth bearing to repeat. There's a story about a preacher who spoke most earnestly about this parable, the parable of the ten virgins or the ten maidens. And it was in a boy's Sunday school class. And finishing the study, he looked up to the boys and seated in the back of the class. And he says, now then, young men, where would you rather be? In the light with these virgins that are wise or in the dark with the foolish ones? However, the reply of the boys wasn't the one the preacher was hoping for. I'll let you put that together on your own. You must be careful not to overinterpret the parable. The parable is not an allegory. We're going to get lost in the details if we let it happen. For one thing, we are the bride of Christ. We're not the bridesmaids of Christ, if you will. We are the bride of Christ. And so it's easy to immediately categorize yourself in one of the two groups, the wise virgins or the, uh, the, the foolish virgins. So already the parable begins to break down if you treat it in more of a literal case. Jesus is adapting a common cultural story that make meaning about the necessity of our readiness and about the truth that no one will know when Jesus is coming. Jesus says his kingdom of heaven will be like. And he's not saying that this will be like the ten maidens, but rather he's saying this will be like what happens to the ten maidens. Um, This parable, in my opinion, reads a lot like when you're a child and you're playing hide and seek. Now, Wesley, at the end of counting, whatever number you count to when you're playing hide and seek, what do you say immediately after you say the last number? What is he going to say aloud? Ready or not, here I come. This is exactly how this parable reads. 97, 98, 99, 100. And then Jesus says, ready or not, here I come. Yes, sir. That is how the story reads. The five of the girls who are ready with extra oil and there's five that are not. But even in their readiness, the five wise maidens is not all quite true. All ten maidens fall asleep because the bridegroom is delayed. The parable reads a bit like Luke chapter 15, the parable of the lost sheep. This is a trilogy of parables in Luke chapter 15. And the parable wasn't necessarily this missiological pulse of God's nature to go after the one lost sheep. The scripture says in Luke 15 that... The shepherd leaves the 99 and then goes out to find that one lost sheep. It was also, and maybe more primarily the interpretation is not the missiological nature or pulse of God to go after the one lost, but maybe it's more about indicting the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law because they didn't think they needed anybody. They didn't need a savior. They didn't need a shepherd, if you will. And so the scripture says this, that the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes after the one. Now, the problem with this is that we know that the one who is lost needs a shepherd. We know that. However, the shepherd has now left the 99, and we realize that the 99 are in need of a shepherd too. It's an indictment against Israel saying, hey, you don't think you need a shepherd, but you are without a shepherd too. What he's saying is, and the story is all about when Jesus tells the parable of the lost sheep, is that all 100 need a shepherd. Who needs a shepherd? We all need a shepherd. Who needs a savior? We all need a savior. Who needs to be ready for the return of Jesus Christ? All of us, both foolish and wise, need to be ready for the return of Jesus Christ. The point here is that we shouldn't avoid literal sleep. That's the plain meaning, if you will. The wide versions, the maidens did sleep. But the point is spiritual awakeness. That is, keeping oneself ready in the state of readiness for the coming of the Son of Man. This vigilance is required because the time of the return of Jesus, that day, that hour, cannot be known in advance. And this is what you really have to deeply understand. That even in lots of Pentecostal circles, that there are timelines, that there are... um, Especially about the end of time events and things like that and seven years of this and three and a half of that and three and a half of this and all these different events that are supposedly going to happen and when they happen that you cannot know. Even if you are somehow able to mark the first day of the tribulation and when it begins, the return of Jesus Christ. You can't know. Nobody knows. 
In fact, Jesus will say that even the Son of Man does not know the hour or the time. Only the Father knows. If there was one piece of information that God kept from Jesus, that's it. The hour when he looks at the Son and says, it's time. And if Jesus doesn't know that hour of his return, then certainly we don't know the hour of his return. The point and the major core of this parable is saying we don't know when the time of the return of the king is. So you must be awake. Be awake for the return is near. Maybe the greatest meaning we can get from this and not in overinterpreting the parable is wake up. Jesus is coming. Be awake. Be ready. Wake up. The Lord is coming soon. And this really shouldn't be some fearsome moment. Um, theologian Michael Bird calls this uh, rapture trauma. Theologian Chris Green said that he had nightmares before the age of five of the rapture happening and him not being ready. There should not be any fear of the return of the Lord. Nor should it be preached that there is fear in the return of the Lord. This is the most joyful moment of our lives when Christ appears to us. And the truth is, is that Jesus is already here. Don't miss that fact. He'll come back bodily one day in the future, but the presence of Christ is with us and in us. It's not that he's not here. It's simply that he will come in bodily form at his return. I pray that tonight that you go home and you read Matthew's chapter 24 and 25. The, the chapters are closely linked together. It's really the whole context of this particular parable. The disciples are trying to get a time and a date out of Jesus when he returned at the end of the age. And Jesus refuses, basically, in, in Matthew chapter 24. Uh, Jesus will tell all kinds of other signs and symbols of the raising of the temple in 70 AD that happened. Uh, in verse uh, 24, of verse 3b, it says, Tell us, they said, when this will happen and what will be the sign at the end of the age. And Jesus rattles off a bunch of information about the signs of the fall of Jerusalem. And when that happens, that is fulfilled in 70 AD and the raising of the temple uh, by the, the, the Romans. And then he answers the question the disciples had asked at the beginning in verse 36. He says, but the day or the hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but the, only the father knows. And then again in verse 42, it says, therefore keep watch. Because you do not know on what day the Lord will come. And then one more time in verse 44, it says, So you may also be ready, because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect Him. And R.T. France says of this, Throughout this whole long section, Jesus deliberately refuses to give the disciples the sign of what they had asked for. The timing of the return of Jesus. And the final judgment cannot be calculated or foreseen. Readiness for those climactic events can be achieved only by living all the time in such a way that the unannounced arrival need not be a disaster, but rather be a time of praise and reward for a life lived well and opportunities taken. The truth is, is when you read this parable, you immediately want to categorize yourself in one of the two groups, either the five that are wise or the five that are foolish. But we are the bride of Christ. The hearers of Jesus would have known this process well of what Jesus is talking about. A groom would come with his bride into town and then he would parade his new bride through the town that evening. And all the people of the town would come out to meet them in the streets and clap at them and, 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 and share in the joy of their new nuptials. And then they would go to the house where the banquet feast would be prepared at their nuptial celebration. And then he would take the longest route, as it is, through the city to the home where they will celebrate uh, together. The lamps are not necessarily the lamps that we think about with the wick. There's actually a problem in the translation there where it seems like it's a, like a hurricane lamp, if you remember them. Um, like a lamp that has a wick and it would be trimmed. But in the actual original language, it's not a hurricane lamp. It would be a... a a, several sticks tied in a bundle, and then it would be dipped into the oil like a torch. So it would have uh, been necessary uh, to bring extra oil with you because that torch would have gone out relatively quickly. And this speaks to this idea that we need to tend the flame inside of our hearts, tend the fact that God is 
the flame that is alive in our hearts and that the Holy Spirit supplies the oil consistently. And so these several sticks are bundled together and they're dipped into the jar of oil. You cannot lay them down. It will go out. You must keep the torch in readiness. The focus on the parable is the simple matter of preparation versus unpreparedness. It's about single-mindedness in preparation. And I'll be honest with you as I meditated about this particular uh, scripture that maybe the lost meaning of the parable is also the issue of patience. Perhaps these young maidens have an illustration to us to a large degree that in our youthfulness that we have no patience. And for patience, really, we have no patience for patience and we have no patience for preparation either. If I reflect on my younger self um, one of the things that I hated to do was to prepare for certain things. Not in the academic field. That was never a thing that I did not prepare for. But on the regard of other things, I just wanted to get it done. You know, just get it over with. That's why I, I went through a period of time when I would time myself cutting grass. I realized that that's just weird, but I wanted perfect efficiency, I guess, in, in the job. And I had no patience for patience. And as I get older, I realize that now I have more patience for preparation and more patience for patience. I want to do things right because I've done things wrong so many times in the past. I'm like, this is getting old. I realize that if I just did it right the first time and was well prepared the first time, I wouldn't have such trouble. And have to go back and do it all over again. Some things come with the wisdom of age. Yes. And so in the youthfulness of these young maidens, we see some level of impatience they've grown tired and so they fall asleep they've grown weary and so they all are not prepared all 10 of them are not prepared who needs a shepherd all the 100 sheep need a shepherd who needs to be prepared all 10 maidens wise and foolish need to be prepared I'm going to talk more about Mary in, this, in Scripture next week, but Mary Magdalene is considered the apostle to the apostles. She was sent by Jesus uh, himself to the apostles to tell them of his resurrection. She is appointed to that task. Jesus rises from the dead. Mary's the only one around, and she says, he, Jesus says to her, go back and tell the apostles that I have risen from the dead. That's why she's considered the apostle to the apostles. She was sent to the apostles. And why was she doing this? Why was it given her task? Because she's the only one who was there. Peter and John looked into the tomb and left. But Mary, in her patience, stayed and lingered at the tomb. And it's really a, a beautiful anticipation of the return of Jesus Christ. That sometimes we just need to linger in the presence of Jesus. Yes. Linger where he was. Linger where he has been. This parable is really perfect for this Advent season. Advent is about anticipation of God's work in our lives today. We look backward towards Jesus' first coming, Christmas as we celebrate it, and then we look ahead to his second coming. And in both places, the meaning is the same, that we recognize and anticipate that God shows up. He is the one who arrives. He desires to be with us. Therefore, anticipation is the necessary element because of the arrival of God is always surprising. Always surprising when God shows up. Um, Becca and I have recently entered into a different stage of life, as I want to call it. Um, Becca is 40. Just wanted to say that. I'm 39. Um, I'll pay for that later, I'm sure. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, Becca will be 41 and I'll still be 39 for a month and a half. I can't wait for that. But anyway, uh, the kids are now all in school. All four of my children are in school. And I'm telling you, that is a paradoxical moment to realize that we can leave the house without the children at the same time. I mean, that was, I mean, we've never lived close to family, lived in Florida for almost nine years and here in, in central Kentucky for almost eight years and 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 throughout that almost entire time before we had children 12 years it's been wesley will be 13 in january that's mind-blowing so for 13 years we had somebody in tow and then we just kept adding to them all four of them you know 
And I, and, I, and I just, I stopped and I thought about this, like, wow, you know, free, you know, no, there's just a little different than that. But at least for seven hours a day while they're in school, you know, five days a week, we have this moment where there's this, like, paradox that happens, this phenomenon is what I'm going to call it, that our kids are being cared for and our presence isn't necessarily needed at the house at all times. My meditation on this fact has been this, that God's presence is always with us. Yes, sir. Emmanuel, God with us. That no matter where we are geographically or physically, the presence of God is with us. Listen to me when I say this, and this is the clear point, I think, of this particular uh, um, scripture, the parable. That God is always coming to us. That the bridegroom is always coming to us. He came to us in his first advent. He comes to us again in the future. And the beauty of that is powerful. Listen, when you leave church, when you leave this building on Sunday morning, you don't leave Jesus here. He goes with you. When you leave the altar, you don't leave Jesus at the altar. Christ comes with you wherever you go. When you leave the place of prayer, you don't leave Jesus. Jesus is with you. And that's the clear point of this parable. The meaning is, is that maybe beyond all uh, maybe common readings of this parable, thinking that we're not going to be ready or terrified that the groom will come and we're not ready for his return. It's a joyful parable. It's about the joy of the bridegroom coming for his bride. We're not the maidens. We are the bride and Christ comes with us. He takes us with him to joyful celebration. Our bridegroom is coming to meet us. The most optimal position, I think, is that of readiness. With lamps burning, with oil trimmed well, with ready for extra oil in case that he's delayed even longer. That is the optimal situation you can put yourself in. The second best solution is that even if you run out of oil because you weren't prepared, remember that even if darkness surrounds you, and certainly in this world it does surround us, yes, sir. that Christ is still coming. Yes. Don't leave. Stay vigil. Stay ready. Christ is coming to you. Chris Green writes, He, Christ, is the everlasting flame, the one who keeps our lamps burning, and the Word alone, His Word alone, lights our way to the Father. For Him, even the night shines like the day. Why then would we even need these lamps? We're not merely attendants at this wedding. After all, we are His bride, not the bridesmaids. At the end of the book of Matthew in chapter 28, verse 18, we're given what is called the Great Commission. I will read it, but I want you to pay very close attention to the last sentence of the commission. It says this, as Jesus says to his disciples, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And the last sentence and words of Jesus before his ascension are this. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That is the comfort to know that Christ, that even though bodily he's not with us now, that he's with us still. The meaning of the parable is that Christ is coming to us. Whether our lamps are trimmed or not, whether we're wise or foolish, Christ is on his way. Yes, sir. The point of the parable is not just preparedness. The point of the parable is Christ is coming. So if you can, and please be ready for his return. So you may ask questions about how can we be ready for the return of Jesus? It's very simple. Do what Jesus said at his first advent. Repent. The kingdom of God is near. That's all there is. 
That's how you're ready. That's how you prepare your heart. That's how you keep your lamp trimmed and burning. That's how you prepare with extra oil. It's to remember that our lives are one of repentance. For the kingdom of God is near. I love the parables. And my favorite parable in all the scriptures is always the same. You may, I, I think I've preached it three, three or four different ways um, in this church over the last eight years. And my favorite parable by far is the Good Samaritan. Actually, it's my favorite scripture, period. And the reason for this is because of the nature of the interpretation that we can miss if we just gloss over it. I would, it's a good story about a Samaritan. Somebody who was ethnically considered a dog to the Jews. And how good the Samaritan was. But that's not really what the story is all about. It's Jesus' self-identification. Because Jesus comes to us when we're beaten up by the enemy along the roadside. We're wounded. We're robbed. We're poor. We have nothing. Christ comes to us. He heals our wounds. He bears us on his own burden, the burden of our of carrying us to the end. He pays for us. He leaves us taken care of at the end. And then he promises to return for us one day in the future. That is maybe not commonly considered, but it is one of the greatest Advent parables that there are. Because there's the promise of the return of the King promise that Jesus is on his way and that he's always coming to us and he'll be near to us soon. And so that is the point that I want to drive home, maybe more than anything else that you read in that parable, is that Christ is with us, both that he's with us now and that he's coming to us soon. So let us prepare our hearts today for his quick return. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Jesus, I thank you for your advent is near. I thank you that you're returning to us quickly. And Lord, as every time that we light one of these advent candles, it's a reminder to us that the light of the world is on its way. And that we not only need to learn patience in this life, for your return. But we need to learn, Lord Jesus, what it means to be prepared in our hearts for you to come back. Let all things of this world grow dark in the light of your glory. Let us learn to be focused on you, prepared for your arrival. And let your grace be shed abroad in our hearts, Lord Jesus, this season. Especially as we gather together with families. Let us learn to be patient with one another. Patient with our church family. Patient with our biological family and extended family. Lord, I pray that teach us to be gracious with one another prepared for your arrival because in that moment you will eclipse every other thing on this earth you are what matters Lord and I pray that you would come and make your kingly reign in our hearts today we ask that in Jesus name and the church said amen this last song is called Noel. For those of you who don't know what the word Noel means, it means Christmas. It means celebrating the first advent of Christ. So would you stand and let us sing of the Lord's arrival.
Amen. Well, I'm going to say this because it's necessary to say. This may be the earliest you've ever gotten out of church with me. <laughs> so beat the Baptist to lunch and then sit down and have a meal with them, okay? Because you're going to celebrate that meal with them soon in a few days. Let's pray. Hold up your hands if you're going to receive. Father, I pray that you would bless us and that you would keep us and that you would turn your face towards us, that the light of the glory of your face would shine upon us and that you would be gracious unto us. And Lord, that you would give us your peace. We believe this and we ask for this in Jesus' name. Let peace dwell in our hearts, Lord Jesus, today. I ask it in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. Bless you. Have a wonderful day in the Lord. Uh, don't forget, next Sunday is Acts of Harvest as well as our Christmas party for New Harvest. Bring your best junk that you wrap up in a present. Have a wonderful day, and we'll see you next Sunday. I have two quiet seat prizes to give away. Ms. Kim.